So we're talking about falling back in like this morning. God doesn't want our relationships or our life in general to just be obligation. We're gonna be zooming in a lot on marriage today for sure, but also there's a lot of conversation about God's heart for us in life is that we are people of passion and people of joy. God doesn't want us in our parenting or in our work or in whatever it is to be people that don't have passion, to be people that have lost that fire and that spark. He wants us to have passion and like. Again, the, the verse that Pastor Josh brought up last week, last Sunday, it used the word intoxicated, be intoxicated by her love, which the actual picture there in that word is this like stumbling drunk idea. It's just so intoxicated, so passionate, so in like with this person. That's how God wants us to live. We're going to explore that a lot this morning. But just like uh, Pastor Josh last uh, Sunday, he showed us that clip from Up. I'm not going to show us a clip from any movies today, but I've got some movie pictures, some, some covers of some movies up here. Maybe you know some of these. Um, I've got La La Land as the biggest one up there because that's the one everybody's seen. Last night, Sarah was helping me. She was like, nobody knows any of these obscure movies or shows that you have watched. And they're going to be like, what are, what are these? But all of these, and there's so many more like them, follow this very similar idea, which all of these will, will highlight La La Land because it's got singing and dancing and, and Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone. And I, you know, who doesn't love that? But they follow this same sort of pattern, which is these people meet each other and there's so much passion and the spark and the way they like start to hold hands in the theater, you know, and it, like they have goosebumps and it's all of this beautiful stuff. And there's these big romantic gestures. They love each other. They like each other. But then you watch throughout the movie as little decision by little decision, moment by moment, what starts to happen is they lose that passion. They lose that spark. And by by the end, spoiler alert, they get to the spot where they're not together anymore and they see each other across this room and they kind of give this nod like, you know, like, man, we had such a good thing, but it's gone, you know? And that's kind of what all these movies do is, again, like Hollywood's picked up on a thing that for so many people, this is what happens. That we have all this stuff at the beginning, this spark and this fire, but we lose it over time. And it's so, somewhere along the way, we stopped kind of doing some of these things. Somewhere along the way, that passion left, that like went away. But where these movies are different from, I think, what God has for us is these movies say, okay, well, that's it. And that's how these stories end. But God is a God of resurrection. And there's so much hope this morning for all of us that God wants abundance and joy and passion in our life. And he loves us enough to help us get there or get back there. So we can fall back in like, and we're going to talk about that this morning. And again, we're going to zoom in on marriage quite a bit, but there's going to be so much of all of this that's for every single person, regardless of your season of life. So there's three questions that we're going to uh, explore throughout the message. That's kind of how this whole thing is going to go. Three questions that we're going to look at. The first question is, how do we lose that passion? How do we lose it? What happens to us? What happens in our life that gets us to a place where we've lost that like that we had at the beginning? So that's the first thing we'll do. The second thing is, why does God want us to have that passion and that like? Why is it important to him that we do that? Why is it important that we will put in the work and do the hard things that we need to do? Why does God want us to do that? Why isn't he okay with us just doing the things we need to do, but he wants this extra for us? Why does God want that? And then lastly, we'll talk about how do we get it back? What, what are some things we can do? How can we start down this road of falling back in like? And so before we jump in any, any more, I just, uh, just like a disclaimer or a caveat, whatever you want to call it, something that I just feel like God really laid on my heart early in the week to just bring up and talk about. Um, that's like messages like this it, it, when, you know, about marriage and relationships can be really difficult for a lot of people. Um, depending on what's happened in your life, depending on the season of life you're in, these can be challenging. And I think that there is a temptation to, and I think it's from, I don't, I don't think this, it is from the enemy that we would, if we're not in this season of life, if we've been through a divorce or we're going through a divorce, that we pile some unnecessary shame and guilt on ourselves and we beat ourselves up, all of this stuff starts to happen. And um, I had a situation over the last couple of weeks where, uh, like some things happened and I was really beating myself up. There was lots of shame and stuff that I was piling on myself for something that I'd done. And just, yeah, really in it kind of just like, yeah, beating myself up. And a friend of mine just came along one day and he just said, man, like this doesn't need to be said, but let me just say it like you're okay. And like th this happens. 
you know? And it, like, the thing that didn't need to be said turns out very much needed to be said, and it very much brought a lot of healing to me. And so this morning, maybe it doesn't need to be said, but let me say, if you've been divorced, you're going through divorce, you're not a failure as a Christian. We're not bringing up these messages or going through these things. And actually, let me say this. We're all failures as Christians. That's a better way to say it. Every single one of us is. We've all done things. We're all broken, every single person. And don't listen to the lie that this is way more special or or a worse thing than whatever else it might be. We're all in that same boat together. There's no second-class Christians here this morning. It's not like married Christians are up here and then divorced Christians are down here. That's not how this works God is bringing all of us back to him. Romans chapter three, verse 23. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Everyone, all. We're all in this together. We're all, high school musical. We're all in this together. Okay. But we're all in that boat. That's all of us. And so this morning, what I hope you hear is that God does have good things for us. God does have good designs. God does have a plan that he wants us to walk through when it comes to our relationships and our marriages, all of that, yes. God also has a way of calling all of us into passion and like in our life. And so don't beat yourself up this morning. Don't pile shame on yourself that God is not piling on you. Okay, God's grace is sufficient. So as we're continuing on in the message, the first big question is, How do we lose our passion and our like? What happens? How do we lose it? What is going on? So the short answer to this is that life happens, okay? Life happens to us. There's so many things in life as we are progressing through life and things start to happen and things get more busy, all of the above, life happens to us. And my my, my heart behind this little section of the message is, is that if we're not careful, life does just happen to us. But I think Jesus invites us into this whole new thing and gives us this beautiful gift that says, life doesn't have to just happen to you, but you can navigate life with Jesus and you can be careful about things and you can take your thoughts captive and not just let these things happen to you, but you can follow Jesus and you can actually um, bring new things to the table. You don't have to let things just happen, but you can have a say in how you're gonna do this as a follower of Jesus. But when we let life just happen to us, a bunch of things happen. And so here's just a few ideas that I had this week. This is what happens. This is what um, can come out of just letting life happen to us that can rob and kill our passion in our like. The first thing that can happen is we get tired. Just simple. We get tired doing the same thing over and over and over and over. There are so many things, if you were to think about your life, that when you started doing them, they were these things that you loved and enjoyed. But over time, as we've gotten tired, they're not as fun anymore. We don't enjoy them as much any more. We get tired. Galatians chapter six, verse nine, this is Paul. And he says, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. So what I love about that verse, he says, hey, don't get tired of doing this, which to me means he understands that it's very possible to get tired of doing it. And so he's saying, don't, because it can happen. Every single one of us can get tired of doing what is right, doing the good thing, doing whatever we were so passionate about at the beginning. Life has a way when we just let life happen to us, we get tired and we start to lose the joy in some of those things. And so he's saying, we need to guard against that. We need to be careful about that. Don't get tired. Keep that passion. Keep that fire. I was thinking about, so I've got two kids. My, my son Reese is six. My daughter Beck is four. And we have like this bedtime routine that we're always doing with them. And every single night, it's pretty much the exact same thing. And I was thinking about it this weekend, kind of chuckling, but also like, ugh, you know, like a little bit of conviction. Like when they were babies, dude, the way that we would read books to them, it was like, we're holding the pictures. And I'm like, do you see the dog? Look at the dog. What, you know, what color is the dog? Taking all the time, flipping through. And then we would sing Jesus Loves Me at the end, you know, and this like beautiful thing. You should hear how fast I can sing Jesus Loves Me right now. <laughs> uh, pff, done, gone. I'm skipping pages. I'm like, the dog's already gone, okay? Go to bed, right? Like, we're, it's this thing that was so sweet back here, and I loved it. And like the kids were reading the book, and we're singing. And now, if I'm honest, sometimes when I'm tired, it's just like, Ah, we'll turn off the light. You know what I mean? It'll be all right. Jesus does love you. We'll sing it quick. 15 seconds, bam. And so, I, you know, all of us, I think, 
can recognize that in our life, that as life happens to us, we get tired, and that can rob us of the passion and like that we used to have in our relationships. All of us, I'm sure, can look at with our spouse, with who, you know, whoever we're in relationship with, that, man, if we're being honest, there's so many things we used to do that we don't do, and it's just because we're tired. Life has happened to us. Number one, we get tired. Number two, we get busy. We get busy. Our culture is very much going down the track of just busier and busier and busier. There's always something else that you should be doing. There's always something else you could be doing. And if you're not doing it, you're missing out. Life is busy. And if we're not careful, we'll let busyness rob us of our passion and our like in life. We're going to go to the book of Haggai real quick. Haggai chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. There's this great little passage in here that I think just sums up this whole picture so well. So we'll read this, Haggai chapter one, five through nine. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies says. Look at what's happening to you. You have planted much, but harvest little. You eat, but are not satisfied. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. Look at what's happening to you. Now go up into the hills, bring down timber and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You hoped for rich harvests, but they were poor. And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins, says the Lord of heaven's armies, while all of you are busy building your own houses. So we'll just let the sit for a second. This verse is massive. There's so much to walk through in here, but I, I, I love it because I think it paints the picture so well of what busyness does. I get so focused on all the different things that I wanna do or the things that I feel like I need to do. I start doing them over and over and over, doing them more and more, thinking it will fix whatever the problem is, thinking it will satisfy, thinking it will get me to the place I wanna get to. But just like the verse says, if I'm being honest, it's like I do this and then there's nothing to enjoy about it. It's like I'm pouring all of this into pockets with holes and it's gone just the moment that I get it. And there's always something else I need to do and I get busier and busier and it robs me. I'm so busy on all these things and doing everything and focused if I'm honest on myself that I'm losing sight of what's actually important. And this verse highlights it so well in in this uh, context of this verse, he's saying, you're so busy, but the thing that matters most is my house. Like you're busy building your houses and you're neglecting what's most important because you're so focused on yourself, so busy. And so let me just take, the, take a moment to pull the heart of that verse for a second and apply it to us that we're so busy doing all of our stuff, we're neglecting what matters most, which is our spouse. It's our marriage. It's our relationship. I need to be careful that I've got passion and like for my wife and not just so focused on all of the other things that I'm doing. We lose our passion and our like in life when we get too busy and too focused on us. Number three, I think what happens to us in life that uh, causes us to lose that passion, lose that like, is we get hurt. We get hurt. That's real. Every single person in this room has been hurt and has hurt others. And I think, again, if we're not going to be careful and if we're going to let some things happen to us and not be constantly sort of on guard, which is what the scripture calls us to, if we're not careful, that can totally take us out. And that passion can be gone and that like can be gone when we are hurt. There's a character named Peter from the Bible. And most people, I'm sure, know Peter, know his story. But he's one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. And I would, like, if you were going to classify any guy as passionate, it would be Peter. He was constantly doing the most that he could possibly do. And oftentimes it was getting him in trouble. He was always like sticking his foot in his mouth. And, you know, it's like when Jesus is like, um, you know, he's going to wash Peter's feet. And, you know, Peter's like, no way you can wash my feet. There's no way I could let you do that. And Jesus is like, no, I'm gonna. And he's like, well, then bathe me. And Jesus is like, just the feet, bro. You know, <laughs> like, no, no, no. You know, like, but Peter's just like, he's this passionate guy. He's always wanting to do the most, always. Hey, Jesus, I would never leave you. Jesus, I would never let that happen. When Jesus starts talking about the fact that he's gonna die, Peter's like, no way. I'll never let that happen. And at the Last Supper, Jesus is talking with his disciple and he's, and he's saying, hey, one of you is gonna deny me three times before the rooster crows. 
Somebody at this table is going to straight up say they don't even know me three times in a row. And Peter's like, dude, you just tell me who that is. You know, like, there's no way I'd let that happen. And Jesus is like, it's you. And Peter's, you know, there's just no way that he could do it. But sure enough, this moment happens. Jesus is arrested. Peter's kind of on the outskirts watching what's happening. And somebody recognizes him and says, hey, aren't you with Jesus? And he goes, no, I'm not with Jesus. They're like, no, 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 I've seen you with him. Like, are you sure? He goes, yeah, I don't know who that is. And then a third time, no, I don't know who Jesus is, denies Jesus, the rooster crows. And this is where we get this verse. Uh, Matthew 26, verse 75. Did y'all know that Matthew 26 had 75 verses in it? That's crazy to me. At some point, they should have just made it chapter 27, I think. Anyway, I like had to double check it three times yesterday. I was like, there's no way there's 75 verses. There is. All right, anyway. Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. And he went away weeping bitterly. So we've got a guy who's full of passion, full of zeal, full of like for Jesus. And this moment happens. And oftentimes we hurt ourselves, which is what happens in this situation, that Peter hurts himself. And if you know the story, he just goes back to fishing. He, 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 the, the passion, all of the stuff that he had for Jesus in this moment, he's hurt and, and he's hurt by himself. And he goes, I've, I've got nothing left then. And hurt takes him out and it takes Jesus coming back from the grave and going to Peter to put all this back together, which is what's going to happen for us as well. Good news. But we get hurt. I was thinking about my own story that um, uh, I worked at a church in North Carolina for a a little while, and without getting into too many details, it was a rough season of life for me and my family. And very much, I would say, we got hurt at that church. There was real pain and real hurt that happened. And I can tell you, my passion for ministry and church was at an all-time low. I didn't want to do all that stuff. I didn't want to meet up with people. I didn't want to lead classes. I didn't want to do any of that stuff because I was hurt. And so my passion for something that I love to do, for something that I have loved for so long, when, it was, when I was hurt, I had none of that. And I think a lot of us can find ourselves in that place or have found ourselves in that place before. When there's hurt, I don't want to bring like, I don't want to bring passion because I'm hurting. We all have that. So life happens to us. And any or all of these things or a number of things that I didn't mention can happen and it robs us of our like. It robs us. And so with this question here, okay, what do we do about that? What do we do about all of this? We're gonna talk really later in the message, we're gonna talk really practical about things that we can do to rebuild that like in our relationships. But what do we do when that passion and like is gone from us and we just need to get it back? How do we do this? The first thing, and this is good news, but the first thing is we are absolutely incapable of muscling our way back into passion and into like in our life. We cannot just pull ourselves up by our bootstraps enough to actually get in a place of healing and wholeness when it comes to whether we've been tired or busy or hurt and we need passion back in our life. We need God. We need God. Michelle said in her prayer, thank you for the Holy Spirit that God's with us all the time. We need the Holy Spirit in our life, active and working and helping us. We read this verse last week, and we'll probably read it again. It's just such a great verse for for, um, series like this, sermons like this, Ecclesiastes chapter chapter 4, verse 12. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. We talked through all these different blessings and benefits that it is when there's a team, two people together, but at, at the end it goes, but three's even better. Three's even better, and scholars and theologians throughout the years have always identified that third chord as God, the presence of God himself, that he partners with us. If you want to be really strong, if you want to actually be able to heal, if you want to actually be able to move forward, if you want to actually be able to fix things, you need God. We need God to produce good things in us. We need God to help us fix bad habits. That's what we need. It's not the fruit of Tanner that produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's not my fruit. I don't produce those things on my own. I need God. They're the fruit of the Spirit. Last night, Sarah and I were talking about, we were trying to figure out what the order of the fruit of the Spirit was without looking, and she was right, just so you know. 
I had gentleness and faithfulness switched in my head. But as long as you know them, I guess, is the most important thing. It's the fruit of the Spirit, not your fruit. You cannot, just with all your strength, be patient. You can try, and then you'll be upset that you're not good at it right now. And so you need patience. You know what I'm saying? Right? You can try to be all of these things, but you can't. You need God to produce those good things in you. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And I've got it up here. For, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. It's God who's at work within you to give you the ability to do the things that you need to do to give you the ability to help produce those good things in your life. So if you're hurt or busy or tired and you need to get back, get out of that. I need God to come in and help me. That's number one. Because without him, I don't think I can actually do it. John chapter 15, verse five. I am the vine, you are the branches. This is Jesus talking. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing underliners in physical Bibles. If you haven't underlined that, do that. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If I'm going to figure this out, if I'm going to uh, move forward, if I'm going to have to reawaken that like and that passion in my life for my spouse, for my work, for my kids, for whatever, I need God. I can't just muscle it together. I need God because apart from him, I can do nothing. So the absolute first thing when it comes to re-falling in like, falling back in like with our spouse, with whatever it is in our life, we need God. We need the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's his fruit, not mine. And I can try to fix it myself, but I, I think we all know where that goes. I can surrender or submit and, and submit to Christ and give him everything. So the second big uh, question for this message for us to ask is why does God want this for us? Right? Why is God um, not satisfied with we're just doing the things that we need to do to get along and, and, that's, and that's how life looks? Why does he want this extra thing for us? Why does he want this passion and like? And the first thing to just say is this. Number one, God cares about you. God cares about you. God is so invested in you. God loves you so much that he's not okay with seeing you live a life that's not what you could be living because he cares so much about you. God doesn't want you to be miserable. God doesn't want you to, to go through life just with obligation, but he wants you to have passion and joy and like in your life. That's what he wants. Proverbs 17, verse 22. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. Other translations say that be joyful, being a joyful person, that's good for your bones. It helps you to be strong. It helps you to go through life, to enjoy and to be a joyful, passionate, cheerful person. But brokenness, bitterness, a broken spirit that saps the strength from you. You've got nothing left when you're living in that broken place. God cares about you. God does want you to live a rich and satisfying life. And we're gonna talk about that verse in just a second. But it's good for you. It helps you. And that's what God wants for you to be strong and joyful. John chapter 10, verse 10. This is Jesus again. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life or life in abundance. Like, let's read that verse for what it is. He's saying the enemy does want to rob you. The enemy does want to take your passion away. The enemy does want you to live life with just the obligation, with just maybe walking through the motions, doing what you need to do. But I have come that you could have a rich and satisfying life, life in abundance. God wants us to enjoy. God wants us to have passion. God wants us to have like. He cares about us. There's so much love poured out from the Father in for us every single day. He wants us to be passionate, cheerful, joyful people. Now, here's the other thing too. Okay, why does God want us to care about this? Um, we're gonna look at a, a verse here in just a second where it talks about us being Christ's ambassadors. We're, we're Christ's ambassadors to the world. We are representing him. And so here's, here's a, just a, like a, a heart check. God also wants us to be passionate people, one, because he cares about us, but also we're representing him. And so what is it that we're saying about God every single day if we're miserable? 
And just to like hold that for a second, and that's weighty, and I don't want us to feel too much weight, but there's a responsibility every single one of us has if we're in Christ that we're representing him. Now, here's also the beautiful thing that the, in Corinthians, Paul says, I boast in my weaknesses. One of the ways that we're ambassadors for Christ is we're trying absolutely, yes, to live the life that he's called us to, but when we mess up, which we will, that he's given us this beautiful gift where we go, I messed up and I boast in my weaknesses. That's right, I can't do this all the way. And God is with me and God is for me, but we are Christ's ambassadors, 2 Corinthians 5.20. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Again, we're not perfect. We're never gonna be perfect, not in this life anyway. But there's a responsibility. God's saying, hey, here's a target. Here's something to aim for. Here's what I want from you. Here's what I want for you is to be an ambassador. And that's God's joy to do that. It's not like he's looking around and he's like, oh, I guess the only option is y'all. That's what he wants to do. He's chosen you. He loves you. He's pouring out his goodness and he wants you to be an ambassador for him. But let's, let's all be people that walk into that and go, okay, I need to make sure that I'm being a person who actually has passion. Being a person who, if somebody looks at my marriage, I want them to see like, and I want them to see joy and I want them to see romance because I'm an ambassador for Jesus. And my marriage is an ambassador for Jesus. And my parenting is an ambassador for Jesus. And the way I am at my work is an ambassador for Jesus. All of those things. And when I fail, I don't hide it. I don't push it away somewhere where nobody can see it. But part of me being an ambassador is saying, I I've messed up and of course I messed up, but God's grace is sufficient for me. And so the reason that God wants us to care about this is because we should care about him. We should care about how we're representing Jesus in our life, in our marriage, all of it. Before I worked um, back here, so my wife and I used to work here a number of years ago. We moved around a little bit, and then we just kind of came, had a come to Jesus moment. We were like, we love Lawton, Oklahoma, and we love Grace Fellowship Church, and we just want to get back there. I was clapping. That's great. Thank you, guys. Oh, I'll drink really quick while we do that. But we were like, man, we got to get back. And so we just, we just decided to move back. It was super quick. And I, so I went and got a, a job at Lowe's, which I loved that job. It was awesome. Um, but it was kind of an interesting experience for me because everything else, every other job that I've had as an adult, I've been working at church as a pastor. And so kind of what happens is you're very often surrounded by other Christians. That's, that's like, you know, here we all are together, which is great. But Lowe's was kind of the first time for me where I wasn't. Like my day-to-day -day was not surrounded by people like that. And so for, um, for me, it was the very real wake-up call and the very real realization of I'm an ambassador for Jesus in my job. And so the way that I am with customers and the way that I am with my language and the way that I am with my tone of voice and the way that I am all day long, there's an importance to it because I'm trying to make sure that I'm representing Jesus because I knew there was gonna be a day, hopefully, where I was gonna be back here working at church and I was gonna have to tell all of them, hey, I'm leaving this job and they were gonna ask to go do what? And I was gonna have to say to be a pastor and I didn't want them to go, really? <laughs> right? That, that was my fear. Like, I don't wanna get to the spot where I have to say, oh, I'm gonna go work at church and they go, well, that, we're not going to that church then. I was like, I've got to make sure I'm an ambassador for Jesus. And I want, hopefully, when all of that you know, happens and I say, hey, I'm going to go work at church, that they go, that makes sense. That's what, that's what I want. All of us are ambassadors for Jesus. Amen. God cares about you, and we should care about God and how we are representing him to the world. All right, so the last idea to explore kind of together is, okay, what do we do? So this is where we're going to have a lot of like what we need to do, which is the painful thing to do, is have honest reflection. We need to ask ourselves, look at ourselves for just a moment and see the places and, and, and be honest to go, this is where I've kind of lost some of this. And maybe, maybe for you, it's like, okay, here's some things that, we're, that we haven't been doing. Maybe you're in a place this morning where you're like, yeah, there's nothing. There's no fire. There's no passion. There's no like, we are going through the motions. We are doing what needs to be done. But that thing that was at the beginning, that is gone. And let's have honesty moment. Let's be brave people. Let's be followers of Jesus that can live in reality. And let's actually look at that and see it for what it is. 
Because if we're gonna go down the road of healing, if we're gonna go down the road of God resurrecting that in us, we need to be able to actually invite God into reality. If I'm making things up and I'm saying it's all fine when it isn't, I can't invite God into that because it's not real. So I need to actually look at my life. And this next scripture we're gonna look at is kind of the heart behind this whole sermon. It's where all of this started. It's out of the book of Revelation. And again, one of the beautiful things about scripture is you can have a, a scripture like the one that we're about to read, which has a context, it has an intent, all of that is very clear. And so what we can do is we can read it for what it is. And then there's, there's also, there's a heart, there's a core to that verse that I can say that I can take that heart and apply it to what I'm going through. And I can apply that to my life. And that's what we're going to do with this verse. So this is Revelation chapter two, verses two through five. And this is God speaking to the church. I know all the things you do. I've seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. So we'll leave it there for a second. This is all good news. This is all good stuff, right? Like, I I see you guys, and I totally see all the different things that you're doing, and they're good things. Right? You are examining these cases. You're looking at these things. You're doing what you need to do. You're not quitting. That's all good. And then you get to verse four. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. So again, he's, he's built this picture. He's like, I see all the stuff you're doing and it's all good stuff, right? Like you are checking the boxes of what you're supposed to be doing, but my complaint is you don't love me like you did at first. That's where I'm not okay. Like you're doing all the stuff you're supposed to do, that's awesome, but the love that you had at first for me is gone, and the love you had for each other at first is gone. So here's our first moment to look at ourselves. Are we going through the motions? In our relationships with our spouse, are we doing the things that we need to do? And is that it? Are we fulfilling the obligations, but that love that he's talking about, that like, is it gone? Have an honest moment right now between you and God. God wants to come in and God wants to bring resurrection and healing. So have an honest moment with him. Where am I at? And then let's take a second too. Let's do this together. Let's go down memory lane for just a moment. Do you remember what it was like at the beginning when you're dating your spouse, right? You're, you're, you're figuring out who they are. And isn't it like, don't you, that's where you have those conversations, those phone calls till two in the morning and it's the goosebumps and you're like reaching over to hold her hand for the first time and you're like nervous and all that stuff. And all those things that you did and those big romantic gestures, you went over the top, take a moment think about all of that stuff because then he gives us what I think is one of the keys to this passage. He goes, look how far you've fallen. And again, let's be clear. That's not to beat us up, but it's to invite us into reality. Look how far you've fallen. And also the key to that little phrase is look how far you have fallen. He does not invite you ever to look how far they've fallen. That's never the point. And if we're going to actually be people that want to bring about resurrection and healing in our relationships, one of the biggest places that we can go where we go wrong is we look how far they've fallen. God invites you to look how far you've fallen. Look at yourself. I would even say, let's go big picture for a moment. With Christianity in general, one of the ways that it's gone wrong is when we start to use the Bible as a lens to look at other people through and not a mirror to look at ourselves. God's inviting us to look at us What do I need to do? How do I need Jesus to come into my life and help me? Look how far you've fallen. Invite God into reality. Take a look at your own self. Where have I fallen short? Where am I not doing these things? Trust that God and your spouse are also doing this, but you're working on you. Where have I fallen? I need to not see fault in them. I need to make sure that I'm looking at it in myself. Here's another verse, Matthew 7, verses 3 through 4. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? We take that honest moment. Jesus is saying every single one of us wants to look at other people. That's what feels better, right? 
Like, I want to highlight the places that you have fallen short. I want to highlight the things that you do wrong. And he's saying, you can't even see that clearly because of the stuff that's in your own, uh, your own life, the stuff that's, the, 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 that's your thing to worry about. So don't be so focused on their thing. Be focused on your thing. Last thing he says, he says, you know, you don't love me as you, as you once did. You don't love me like you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. And then he says, do the things that you did at first. Go back and do those things that you did at first. Remember those things that you did at the beginning with your, with your spouse, your significant other, the way that you loved, the way that you liked, the passion that you had, and then do those things again. It's super simple. It's super practical. They're, they're, like he's just saying, hey, remember how it was and start to do those things again and watch what happens. Watch how that passion starts to maybe get fired up. Watch how that spark comes back. If you're faithful with doing this and over time, watch how God can bring healing and resurrection to you and your life. Do the things that you did at first. I was thinking about with this week when I proposed to Sarah, um, that like, because I'm just like a, you know, it's like a, what do you call it? Silver tongued, what, what do you say? I guess I'm not whatever that is, good with your words. <laughs> because I'm so good with my words, in the like emotion of the moment, the first thing that I said was, I was like, Sarah, I freaking love you. That's what I said. And it's, that's not a good line, but it's what I said. And, but, uh, Ever since then, every time, like every letter that I write Sarah for like an anniversary or birthday or whatever, at the end I put, I freaking love you. Because there's something about that. It's like, that's what, that's what I did at first. And there's something that's like, okay, that's this thing that I can do that helps to keep this thing alive, helps to keep that fire. It's something that I did. And again, so uh, I love cheesecake. I'll just say that. And I, I told Sarah that very early on. I'm like, cheesecake's my favorite cake. And so... Um, there's actually, I don't know, Angie's back there. Angie's made me cheesecake a number of years for my birthday. So thank you for that. Because Sarah's always making sure that there's cheesecake for my birthday because she knows that's my cake. And then this last time we made it together and I realized how hard it is to make cheesecake. That's not an easy thing. But it's this thing, it's like, oh yeah, you said this at the very beginning. And so I'm gonna keep doing that because it's what we do. And then also Sarah and I, last night, we're like having the honest conversations about the things that we don't do anymore because we're all there. Right? Like I'm thinking about, oh, this is what we, we still do this. We still do this. And I'm like, yeah, but we don't do that anymore. If I'm, you know, and these are the things, these are the places where maybe we have gotten busy or we have gotten tired. Those are real. We're all in that boat, but God's calling to us, do the things you did at first. And that's like, to be honest, what that requires of us is probably letting our ego die quite a bit because we're not gonna wanna do that because we are angry or we're bitter or we're hurt or we're whatever it is. But he invites us, do what you did at first and watch what that does. Watch how that heals. Watch how God can use that simple thing. I'm gonna remember and then I'm gonna do what I did at first. My last thing is I just recently, we went to Albuquerque, New Mexico for my grandparents' 60th wedding anniversary. And they might be watching right now, so hello. Nana and granddad. But um, we went for their 60th wedding anniversary and it was awesome. Like all the family was there. We took these massive family photos, really beautiful. Um, and I, I've always admired my grandparents because they do have such a, uh, a beautiful relationship and there's so much like in their relationship. And I'm sure it's hard fought for that. But my grandmother, she, um, she wrote this like poem and one, one of the nights that we were all having dinner, she had it, there, there was like a little table with a bunch of their pictures from their wedding. And she had this poem just sitting there on the table and I read it. And the whole poem was basically about the simple fact that when they started you know, dating and got married, the way that he would hold her hand and the way that he would reach out and grab her is the exact same way that he does it now. And I remember thinking like, that's it. That is the simple thing. It's just like, man, he does the things that he did at first, and that keeps that passion alive. All of us need to look at ourselves, look at us. What do I need to do? How do I need God to come in and help me to do this? Where do I need God to come in and heal something? Where do I need God to come in and challenge something? How can I start to do the things that I did at first? And I, I believe that we will see little by little day by day as God starts to reawaken, reignite that spark. God cares about you. 
God wants you to be a person with passion and like in your life and in your marriage. And I believe that there's a way for us to fall back in like with each other. And it's with God at the center. So can we stand and we're gonna pray together. Super quick reminder before we pray too, we have baptisms happening at the end of third service today. So you're welcome to come back to watch that and we're gonna stream it. There's like 25 plus people getting baptized later. So that's incredible. And praise God for that. Yeah, it's awesome. Let's pray together. Jesus, uh, we love you so much. And God, we are so um, just grateful for your love. God, grateful for your forgiveness and your grace. And God, I thank you that you do have good plans for us. God, that you want us to be people that um, are filled with passion. You want us to be people, God, that have a joy in our life. And that's good for us, God, that strengthens us. And so Holy Spirit, would you help us to be um, on guard against um, busyness and against tiredness and against hurt? God, I pray we could bring all of those things to you and ask you to heal and ask you to make things right in our life. And God, for those of us just in this place right now who've done the work, God, the honesty, the reflection, and God, if, they, if, if uh, in this moment, God, they're in a place where they are realizing that that spark is gone, that fire is out, the like is gone, God, whatever the subtle thing is for them, God, to just say that that's me, that I'm a part of that, God, whether that's just raising their hands for a moment or just in their heart saying, yes, God, that's me. God, I pray that you would come in right now, that your resurrection power, God, that's good for us every single day, God, that can help us to, to walk back into the fullness that you've called us to, that is available this morning. And God, if we think there's no way forward, God, we feel like we're at a dead end. God, you are a way maker. God, you provide a path. Help us to trust you and to walk it. Every single day, God, help us to make the tough, difficult decisions that we need to make. Help us, God, when we need to let our ego die. Help us, God, when we need to be humble. Help us, God, when we need to ask for help. But God, I, I, I believe that what you've called us to is to be a passionate, joyful people that are full of like for our spouse, for life, for our kids, for all of it, Jesus. So help us to do the things we did at first this week. Help us to take that step to start to do things. And God, I thank you that we'll watch and we'll see how you heal and how you resurrect in our life. Jesus, we love you. Pray this in your name. Amen.